Um, I'm Neil Romanek. I'm editor of Feed Magazine. Uh, we cover innovations in uh, online and streaming media and uh, forward-looking broadcast. And um, this is the first of our Feed video roundtables. Um, in this first roundtable, we're going to look at news. Uh, 2020 has been a big news year. We've had catastrophic weather events boosted by accelerating climate change. We've had the pandemic. We've had Black Lives Matter protests in the US and around the world. And of course there's the US elections, uh, which at the time of recording uh, are still not quite comfortably resolved. So um, we have uh, with us uh, Ruba Ibrahim, who's director of operations for Al Arabiya, calling in from Dubai. Carl Swanston, who's director of news operations at CBC News in Canada, he's in Toronto. And joining them are three guests from companies who are developing tools and technology used by broadcasters around the world. Uh, and that's Mark Pitsy, who's the BBC key accounts manager at Vizrt, calling in from Reading near London. Uh, Tom Dickinson, who's president of US-based US operations at TSL Products, uh, calling in from LA. And we have Raul Cospin, director of product strategy for news at Dalet and he's joining us from somewhere in the Alps. So um, I'm gonna jump in with, I'm gonna jump in with a big question. How was your 2020? What was, the, what was the, what were the big challenges of 2020 and what did you plan on? And I'll, I'll start with uh, Ruba and Carl on this. Um, as, uh, you know, as people who operate and manage newsrooms, what was your plan or your hopes or your aspirations at the beginning of the year and then how did they change over the course of the year? Yeah, actually, I mean, all our plans that we had last year at the beginning of the year went down. I mean, in, they were like uh, thrown all in somewhere in a waste bin because we had plans, we had projects, and then we had to uh, totally uh, shift the way we're thinking, the way we're operating, the projects, priorities, targets of, uh, of the year 2020. We're new, we're, I mean, we, we manage two news channels and all of the digital platforms, websites, social media, whatever. So news is our bread and butter. So obviously it's, it hasn't been a quiet news year for the last couple of decades. If I mean, the last decade was even busier than ever. So we expected this year is going to be all about American elections. That was when we started. So our plans were a little bit more focused on the American elections. And then we're going to have a little bit of other coverages here and there, especially our main target is Middle East, North Africa. So we are pan Arab. Our main audience, we only broadcast in Arabic. We only have an English website. So our main target audience is the Arab audience. With the, with the uh, beginning of the pandemic, of course, there was panic. There was panic everywhere because we weren't set up. We always had plans to uh, go to the cloud. We always had plans to uh, function remotely, but we never really put them I mean, into implementation. We tested a couple of things here and there, but then we were at a situation where in one week, we had to uh, pull all of our, most of our staff from the office, keep the crucial on-air people. So definitely we function different from uh, service providers or the wires because we need people to be on studios. We go on air, we need the crews, and we are not set to, um, in a way, uh, to, uh, to manage them and operate them remotely. So we had to keep the uh, critical staff, which we kept almost, 15 to 20 percent of the staff that we normally have in in the newsroom, which was quite a, a big shift for us. Uh, we had to make arrangements, softwares, um, hardware for people to start operating from from their homes. We had to set up VPNs. Normally, we used to have it for crucial staff to operate remotely, and then all of a sudden, we needed all of our reporters producers, graphics people, creative people, promo people. I mean, almost, except for the play out, almost everybody was operating remotely, which actually it was, at the beginning, it was a big panic. And most of the plans, I had to work uh, with my team on most of the plans. But I would say that there were challenges, there are still challenges, but the way it went so smoothly, without a glitch on air, that was my main concern, that we go unnoticed. So the audience couldn't tell. There were limitations in 
capacity of the people on premises, but at the same time, everybody else, we were all supporting the operation from our houses. And one of the main challenges that we had to go through, which I mean, I'm, I'm not aware that it happened somewhere else, is that we were in the process of launching our new newsroom and studios, which was a big project that we were working on for the last year. So the launch was supposed to take place mid to uh, late uh, March. And then the pandemic came. So it was like, okay, we need extra staff because we were doing the piloting and the main operation. So we had, before the pandemic, literally doubled the staff working uh, in the newsroom, technical uh, crews, uh, engineers, everybody. I mean, we were wor working on triple shifts or double shifts to be able to um, balance things between the on-air operation and the piloting operation. So here comes the pandemic where should we launch new studios? Is it a good time, first of all, to launch and brag about your new top-notch, uh, top-of-the-art technologies, a futuristic studio while people are dying? So it's not, it's not a festive occasion. At the same time, people have worked so hard and it's a totally different look. So people will notice definitely that at the same time, so we decided the decision was taken, you know, let's let's keep our studios as they are, continue, put it on hold a little bit, the launch until we see. And then we thought it's going to be a month or two. That was everybody's, intent. maybe a couple of weeks, a month or two, and then things will go back to normal. And then we realized, no, things are not going back to normal. So we might as well launch our new studios. So we had a very, very successful launch where we had the migration of the on-air operation to the new operation. So, um, and we introduced a lot of new technologies. Automation was part of it. We didn't have robotic cameras at the time. We, I mean, so introduced a lot of uh, augment, new augmented realities in studio, virtual, and all of those elements were introduced at the same time with the launch of the studio, which were normally done on coverage basis, not on a daily operation basis. So a lot of things were into a, new, a lot of elements. I mean, we we have like a huge video walls that we needed to fill in uh, while people are brainstorming. I mean, we used to brainstorm through uh, Zoom or somebody at the office and we rotate. Somebody will go to the office. We'll all sit. How do we fill in the screens from an editorial? We need the diversity. At the same time, what actually COVID helped us because there was a lot of material. So material and there were a lot of visuals. You had to cover all over the globe the virus and how does it spread, how does it grow, uh, where does it stop, uh, maps. And so there was, I mean, a, it, in terms of visual, it was a, uh, a rather rich year in, in uh, visuals to be presented on screen. So uh, it was a very, very challenging, yet very, I would say successful, maybe I'm being a little bit uh, uh, over optimistic when I say it's like, yeah, but to have your your whole your full operation newsroom studios, everything migrated to everything new during this pandemic, during those crises, having people operate almost seventy to eighty percent remotely without a glitch. Uh, so I know there are. I mean, I was going into uh, with the team. We were going into the cloud big big time and we were putting plans on how to move to the cloud in terms of our newsroom operation, archiving all that stuff. And now I'm saying, no, actually the way it worked, we can hold it a little bit. We function in a pure avid environment. We have a, just a teeny weeny little bit of talent on the asset management side for the programs, not for the news production. We are big customers of this RT. I think we're one of their main pilot, I mean, we always were great partners with Desert Tea, so we use them uh, very heavily, I have to say. And the last American elections is a big proof on, on this, where we had the biggest show uh, for the American elections. Hmm. Cara, I'd like to hear what, uh, what your, uh, what, you know, how your experience compared to, to Ruba's and, and what was it like at CBC? Yeah, similar. Uh, fortunately, we were on the heels of all of our main projects. Uh, we had a real uh, large technical uh, renewal uh, project here in Toronto, um, you know, updating our studio facilities, our control rooms, our resources area. And that uh, 
we ended that project uh, last summer, I would say. So going into the winter, we were in, uh, in good shape. Uh, we didn't have too many projects here in Toronto happening, some real estate projects. Um, my colleagues on the French side in Montreal were in the midst of uh, moving locations. Uh, so that would have been, uh, well, that is quite challenging for them. Uh, there's, there's pressure to get out of their current uh, facility to get into their new one. And, and needless to say that the new one's not, not ready at all. Uh, but here in Toronto, we were in good shape. Um, so no, no major projects. Um, it happened uh, so suddenly. Um, and in hindsight, it didn't. But somehow, uh, between um, you know January and March, um, you know obviously we were reporting this news, but uh, it wasn't hitting home, and it wasn't until uh, until uh, you know the beginning of March that it started hitting home, and um, we started you know we started getting into contingency modes. We started uh, you know securing uh, outside facilities, uh, radio, television. Uh, we, we, we locked down our, our building to guests. So we had, uh, you know, we had cameras and, uh, and uh, remote uh, radio booths set up in the lobby for guests. Um, but yeah, it's really funny because my, my, um, my, we were meant to go to Mexico, my wife and I and my child, and I opted out the week before because I just felt that something that I had to be at work. And um, so my wife leaves and during that week, everything changed. And I remember picking her up at the, at the airport and it hadn't hit home for her. But yet during that week, um, um, we were, we were de deploying people, we were getting people out of the building, deploying technology. And she came back and I remember when I picked her up from the airport, and for her, nothing, nothing had really changed. And she actually said, "Oh, can we, can we go to the local pub for a, for a drink?" And I and I said, "Well, no. Are you insane? <laughs> no, we can't." And anyhow, so um, so you know, a couple of success stories. Um, we had opted for the Google uh, ecosystem a few years ago, so we're heavy users of you know docs and spreadsheets and Hangouts, etc. And that was really helpful because uh, because there was no training required. People were already using these tools. And the other good news is that uh, we had stockpiled laptops for a Windows 10 uh, project and the Olympics. And we were able to deploy in a few weeks uh, on the English side, 530 laptops to, uh, to staff that did not have laptops. And um, so luck was on our side. Uh, then we had to quickly, you know, add Citrix licenses and VPN and, and all those things. Um, and, you know, there were certain instances where we deployed people with their desktops, uh, namely uh, graphics uh, people, designers, big Mac uh, laptops. Um, and then we uh, quickly uh, discovered uh, Teradici virtual uh, uh, desktop uh, technology and all of our editors uh, worked uh, we sent out with MacBooks and um, and um, they they I say MacBooks I have to get a second guess myself there because Teradici is only PC so it would have been PC sorry so all of our editors uh, work remotely and it's it's really odd because we have all these edit suites that are completely empty but yet uh, the editors from home are accessing those CPUs and, and editing remotely and pushing to play out. And it's quite eerie uh, seeing all these rooms that are empty and, and yet the, the machines are all working. Um, so that was a success story. The other part of CBC is that uh, we're not new to remotely producing uh, news uh, and special events, namely the Olympics. Uh, so we had a very robust team uh, of production folks uh, helping us with technology like Unity, uh, Intercom uh, software for smartphones, uh, we uh, TerraDeck uh, monitor wall returns for people at home. Um, so we also had that happening. Part of the difficulty um, is that um, 
this all happened during March break, which is the, 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 the break where kids are off uh, at school. And um, daycares closed, camps closed, uh, everything shut down. And uh, kids did not resume going to school physically until very recently. So on our employees, uh, albeit uh, they were set up with technology, et cetera, uh, very difficult uh, to be at home working in, in, in those conditions with kids that need uh, attention. Um, parks were closed. <laughs> uh, so it was a little devastating on parents, not a little, it was devastating on parents. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it, it challenged productivity, obviously. So, yeah, so I'd, to hear from the, the vendor side as well, and I think what's interesting is um, as vendors, uh, Vizzerti, Dalat, and TSL products, you get to you get to hear from multiple people kind of what's, you know, you get, you get to hear the things they say to you or the things that people aren't saying to each other. So it'd be interesting to hear kind of what you saw as some of the major, what were the major pain points people had this year and kind of what uh, you saw as, uh, as some of the major themes just from the customers that you were working with. Um, Raul, do you want to go ahead and just yeah, kind of I, I, talk a little bit about that? I mean, obviously our, our customers' issues are our issues. And, um, and pandemic was definitely a, a terrible time for, for, for many of our customers. And, and, and there were really two different cases here. I mean, we had, uh, I remember at that point of time when it's all started in, in March, talking to a charter to New York One. And, and they explained to me that they went basically from 300 people on site to seven people on site in just a week. And, um, and, and this is really because not only because of Dalet, I mean, Dalet was there, but essentially they had the infrastructure ready to support those kind of things. So people that are already, you know, touching on cloud that, 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 that know those kind of technology that have been in place and this kind of things, they can do easily those switch and adapt easily. And, um, and others struggled a lot more because they didn't necessarily have the infrastructure to support this. And then we, we came up, you know, uh, starting to offer what we call the Galaxy X Cloud, but essentially it was a SaaS solution that you can consume out of the box uh, in the cloud, uh, which is uh, basically a remote editing capability and connecting to your newsroom. So we started like this and, uh, you know, customers like France Television uh, started to adopt this kind of way of working so they can get people to work from home. But obviously, as you say, Carl, uh, supplying laptops was always an issue <laughs> because you know uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, users, especially in public TV, say, "Oh, I don't have a laptop, guys. I can't uh, I, I I can't work." You know, so so providing laptops was an issue. But I'm also kind of um, very happy you talked about centralization. I, I think COVID has radically changed the way. Uh, our customer think and and Carl, I heard you, uh, Ruba, I heard you as well, and and really you're not the only one. There is really the before COVID and after COVID, and I think COVID just accelerated what was going to happen anyway. I mean, more and more people are starting to work from home, and by nature, the newsroom is a very distributed organization. You've got reporters, you 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 hire freelancers all the time. I mean. People are spread all over, very often in many sites. I mean, uh, CBC, you are an organization running across many different sites. So um, centralization uh, is, is, get, is getting to, to uh, I mean, really fashionable. And people think like this today. And this was not the case back in March. And now we, we, we just run our um, uh, yearly, uh, customer advisory board starting tonight, actually, for the US. And everybody said, we want to go cloud. We want to go SaaS. We want to centralize everything. And um, yeah, this, uh, this is uh, what's going to happen now. So um, centralized systems uh, serve distributed workforces and, and consume systems as SaaS, so they can be elastic 
So you have uh, the capability to adapt, to react, to changes, to be uh, just uh, agile, uh, effectively. So that's um, that's uh, what we are working on. And uh, I mean, we announced, uh, if you follow the news, maybe not, but if you follow the news yesterday, we announced uh, our new product called Dalet Pyramid, which is exactly about this, which is having all the tools in the single user interface, fully web-based. Uh, this is an end-to-end newsroom uh, system uh, that can be hosted in the cloud, that can be consumed at SaaS, and that will help you newsrooms to uh, centralize your operations, make them more effective, and serve your distributed workforces, basically. Um, Tom, so you, you um just recently joined TSL products yeah. and you had come from uh, the rental house background. So as a, you've seen a, a couple of different angles on this. Um, so maybe give um, some of your sense of what customers have wanted, what the news organizations you've engaged with have wanted over the past year um, and kind of how they've, they've dealt with it. What has that been like? And maybe yeah, sure. from so, the rental uh, side as well as the TSL product side. Yeah, it was, uh, was actually a rental business when this started and uh, I was getting ready for the Olympics and everything else like everybody else was. Uh, TSL has kind of two main markets, the production side of audio speakers and power and stuff that provides the production side. That business just went to almost zero in a matter of weeks because mostly it's mobile trucks, sporting events, live event is where that revenue comes from. So that's how the business just stopped in, 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 in uh, almost immediately and the only pieces that kept were if there was some major integration project going on where they're finishing it up. But that side just kind of definitely had, and that was certainly in the rental business. I was, you know, NEP owned us at the time and NEP, you know, all the trucks, and all the sporting events just stopped, you know, literally in a day. And that certainly, um, you know, service sector took a very a radical, uh, significant drop to say the least. On the, on the DNFs, the company that TSL bought, they're in the station group kind of uh, a business. And what they really focus on is the manual overrides for news, your ability to do ad insertion. And usually those are button panels. You, know, you hit a panel to say breaking news, hit a button to stop the automation system and go to something live. Well, that's in a physical building with someone hitting a button. So the first call was, I need web ag I need web keys for all that so I can do that remotely because I can't have anybody in the building. So we quickly put web keys in so you could do manual breaks, commercial insertion, stop the automation remotely from home from a different location. Uh, the second thing we did is we have a hub and spoke. Most of our networks are distributed where we manage all the stations in station group. And that's being, it's very decentralized. So any station can override and control anybody's other stations play out and stuff. So we quickly, they're able to shift people to, well, we'll have, you know, Arkansas oversee the Ohio station or different things in the play out side of it. So it allowed some people to do a little bit of, well, I can't put somebody in New York City, but I can, I can still have a person running in Oklahoma to oversee New York. Again, just in the, in the piece of live news insertion, got to go live to a spot. I've got to stop automation. I've got to track some information. That's kind of our little piece in between there. Um, and so that actually business continued pretty well because quickly had to write code to do web, uh, web keys, had quickly write code to do more virtualization of our, of our uh, equipment. Um, so actually business in that side was actually pretty good during, <laughs> during COVID and continues because it's a lot of people have quickly wanted to adapt to their workflows uh, quickly uh, to not have to be in, in the knocks anymore, not being in the central, central rooms. So that's been good. And we uh, seek that can kind of continuing but the production side is sort of coming back, but that certainly is the area that, that uh, held out. Yes, in the rental side, you know, I was ready to go to the Olympics, go to Tokyo, have a wonderful, uh, I've been doing that for a long time. And obviously I, I that won't be happening. Well, it'll be happening next year, so it'll be good. So, but yeah, that's the main area is web keys, uh, decentralization of workflows and uh, helping people be able to work remotely and handle that. And certainly going forward, everything we're developing now is virtualization, cloud-based, you know, we're, we're making everything, we're, we're assuming you can't have a person in a room hitting a button all the time. You've got to have that ability to be remoted somehow. Uh, and our biggest projects going on now is it is getting, I think most networks realizing you don't want everything in the same building. You don't want to be all in one place. So like ABC is moving their operation to Woodland, Texas. We're putting in that for the news operation out of New York City. 
that's finishing up this week or two. Uh, there's a lot of you know shifting of not having every part of your business in one building. So news will be in one building and production will be another building. Uh, I think they're all looking at how to not have the backup just be at one city, but actually be more decentralized because I think everyone assumed it would be like a hurricane, not a pandemic where one city is in trouble, not the entire country. So that's kind of our going forward is we see more people asking us to help them decentralize and go cloud-based. Thanks, Tom. Um, Mark, so you um, you work uh, very closely with the BBC. So I don't know if you're able to reveal any BBC secrets as well in terms of how they dealt with things this year. If you if you can throw that in, we'd be very interested. But also for Visitor T, I mean, it was a you know was it was it promised to be a big year with the elections, uh, with the Olympics. Uh, but then you had, you know, all these visualizations around COVID and stuff that people were, you know, trying to get all that information out. So, you know, it seems like Visitor T to some extent is driven by a lot of data. Um, yep. It'd be interesting to kind of hear about that. And, and also kind of how did it go this year for you guys? Um, well, you know, it's what, what did your customers really need, you know, when things change? Yeah. And it's very interesting to hear the stories so far. Um, because, you know, I, I can relate to them all, um, you know, both as a supplier and a consumer, as somebody absorbing the news, what, what changes did we see? Um, when March came about, it seemed that everybody had to react, uh, both, both broadcaster and, and supplier. Um, for, for us, fortunately, in the case of, say, the BBC, they, you know, we, we, we have the automation product, which has been a success in the BBC for many, many years. And that, that by default is a social distancing way of, of making programs. Um, so it wasn't like they had to turn around and say, what are we going to do? We, we can't put eight, nine people in a gallery because already news production, major news production in the majority of BBC sites um, uh, uses, uses the Mossart uh, uh, product. So they realized that that was a, a bit of a blessing. It wasn't something anybody could have predicted this year. It was, it was something always promoted and acquired for you know to save money um not to, to socially distance so that was a success um a lot of uh interesting uh, uh, projects especially in sport as mentioned had to be shelved um because we knew sport would come to a temporary halt and that's why next year hopefully will be a, a more exciting year when it all comes back but but news certainly went on and i truly believe and I happen to know this as a fact, and I know the BBC is very happy for me to mention this. Their viewing figures, their, their traditional uh, broadcast news viewing figures rocketed up. And that does include the regional news as well. The reason for this is, is quite simply that more people were working from home. Um, so we were going back to watching traditional television bulletins. Sure, we've got the apps, we've got the 24 hours, we've got iPlayer and, and everything. But people were... We, we, we're watching news the way they would have done many, many years ago, you know. Um, in the UK, it's generally, you know, your, your 6 a.m., your 9 a.m., your, your, your 1 p.m., your 6 p.m., your 10 p.m. And, of course, in the UK, there was the 5 o'clock slot, which is when the Prime Minister addressed the entire country. And everybody tuned in, to use an old-fashioned term. They tuned in because um, everything the Prime Minister was telling us effect, affects all of our lives, okay? So... You know, there's a lot of pressure on the government to say the right thing. It was very controversial. They would use uh, this type of technology, everybody had to this year, to take live questions. And it became so important. We had to trust what we're hearing in the news. As far as us as a supplier, um, we had to certainly direct and prioritize our, our attention. We do lots of exciting uh, things in the virtual reality. Uh, Ruba will, will know all about that. And sure, the, the election was... Was, was coming, um, Trump, very, very controversial president, as we know. So that all had to be planned for. The priority number one became how we can help the broadcasters continue to make programs. So fine having what they had in place, a lot of people that maybe did not have automation in place would have uh, found workarounds to have less people in the gallery. But the immediate attention became on remote production. You know, what else can you do? It's not just the main bulletins, but other programs needed to be, to be made. And do we have the technology? Of course, VizRT acquired new tech um, a year or two ago. And, um, you know, a lot of the focus is to make, um, shall we say, a lot more affordable um, 
remote production, or shall I say NDI production, um, and also cloud-based solutions. And as the year has gone on, I've seen that popularity raise and raise, especially to pave the way for, for 2021. So yes, we were affected just as the, the, the customer, the broadcaster was affected, you know, business would have slowed down a little bit, but we did know that, you know, the show goes on, the news goes on, the more eyes are on it than ever, you know, data has got to be up to date, how it's displayed. Sure. If you can make it more interesting, brilliant, but people wanted that information. Um, so I, you know, one thing, one positive thing about 2020 is the year of the return of traditional uh, broadcast news, I would say. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's a one kind of look I've, I've got of the whole year. Is that uh, Ruben, Carl, is that, uh, does that jive with your experience? Did, did you have a sense of the audience changing or the audience being much more engaged with the broadcast, um, kind of broadcast news? Um, I mean, definitely the viewership has uh, skyrocketed at a certain point where we have for the main, the convention, I mean, the, the TV screen. Uh, I mean, normally it used to be more or less more on the digital platforms than the TV screen. Definitely people were at home, they were confined. So the families for the first time in I don't know how many years were together. Okay, there was no option. So they used to watch all of the news. I mean, two things definitely, TV, I mean, the uh, TV set is back uh, in the households, but at the same time, the viewerships on the digital platforms has never been higher. People are interacting uh, big time with all platforms. At the same time, this is when we prove that we always say we try to fascinate people with nice graphics, good pictures, but the mediums that have won really and we're at the top. Uh, I mean, during this during this pandemic are the ones that provided the best content. So it was all we always say content is king. This is what drives us all. But I mean, we know that there are certain age groups that would require different formats and setups and fascinations that I mean, the the fact that we have, I mean, as journalists, we always believe definitely everything revolves around content. But this is where we prove that people watch the TV station that gives gives them more numbers, content, precautions, more practical uh, information that they can relate to. So definitely it changed the consumption of, I mean, I wouldn't say changed, but it retuned the consumption of news, regardless of the, um, the platform mm. during the pandemic. Carl, was that, did you kind of notice the same thing? Yeah, uh, where my head was going now, it's interesting uh, because, yeah, our ratings were, were really, really good in the months of March and uh, April. Um, and it's funny because we, we were literally in, in breaking news mode for about two months. So not only did we have the pressures of, of all the obvious things, but, um, you know, we, we, uh, we were, <laughs> our staff was required to, to, to work harder than they've ever worked uh, in these mm -hmm. conditions because we were in breaking news and yeah, reflected in our, in our ratings. Um, but where my head was going was, you know, and then people got distracted with the uh, US election and uh, now people are getting distracted with, uh, or, or are interested in, in a vaccine solution. But what I'm wondering is, you know, what happens to news after all this has passed? Um, are we going to lose uh, our audience to a change, a fundamental change in, you know, work-life balance? And, um, you know, with COVID, people are reading more. They're, they're, they're engaging uh, uh, family games, all these things. And I'm just wondering if in the end, people are going to turn the page on news a little bit. And, and focus on other things, activities. Um, so that'll be interesting to, to, to track that. I mean, so do you, do you have a, a sense of that actually happening or? You know, from personal it... experience, just talking to people that are close to me, um, mm -hmm. some people had stopped watching the news, right? Altogether um, and watch Netflix. <laughs> mm -hmm or other, you know, CBC programs, uh, we have our own app, uh, but, um, and I'm just wondering if that's gonna be a, a bit of a trend 
um, especially with our younger demographic. Actually, if I may come in here, yeah, all yeah. even the VODs have increased significantly during the pandemic. So everything, because people are at home, normally people were out, activities, whatever. So definitely it will change. We know, I mean, we witnessed throughout the last years that whenever there is breaking news, our viewership peaks. I mean, I mean, it goes to, towards its peak and then it, go, it goes down. During wars, it's the same. During the let's say, any premier, uh, I mean, the football leagues during the Olympics, definitely, uh, I mean, it goes up and it goes down. Actually, it's the nature of the consumption and as well, it's the nature of the consumption of news, even before the pandemic, it has changed from watching a big screen towards watching your mobile or your iPad, different kind of that. I mean, the habits of consuming news were different. They went back into the regular methods. They will go back most probably into more digital, uh, digital oriented uh, mediums. But at the same time, we cannot also negate that. I mean, Netflix, uh, we have our platforms, Shahid and other. They have never hit bigger numbers in viewerships and in consumption of, uh, of uh, series, uh, movies, whatever. So TV, definitely news. I mean, people used to be more hungry and thirsty for news because it would tell them when are they going to be out of their uh, how, out of their confinement or when can they travel because this is what you get from news while okay you get this portion from from news channels and then you go to forget about it on netflix um star z or i don't know any other uh, digital platform so it actually it's the the habits that have changed during the pandemic more than more, more than anything else I, th I there... think one thing that I that I that I noticed, um, and it, it's kind of slightly moving on to the technology, but it's a very visual thing. Obviously, is what we're doing right now. Um, mm. You know, immediately you couldn't have guests in studios, so you know, thank God this technology was available. You know, if this happened 20 years ago, you're going to hear a voice on a phone, or you'd use the old ISDN uh, communication, whatever you can do. But if you have a lock a laptop at home, and most people do. Um, you have to have something installed, Teams, uh, uh, Skype, uh, of course, Zoom. And then all of a sudden, those guests are, are communicating with the anchors in the studio. And that's become a way of the world. Now, interesting what Ruba said about the consumption of news. We are used to looking at things on smaller screens because we're on the go. We've got great phones, the, the iPhone or whatever phone you, you, you choose to use are, are mini computers. And you can, you can check in any time. The quality is getting better. And the quality on the big screens, if we go back to traditional uh, watching of the news, is fantastic as well. So how, do I, how did our eyes adapt to this poor quality? Because I've, I've heard many a, a presenter, anchor say, oh, I'm sorry, but the picture's breaking up or the audio's breaking up. We'll have to go back to you later. It's because the, the bandwidth of, of where they're calling in from isn't good enough to provide the quality that we, that we want to expect. And, and often not, I'll turn the, um, the BBC News on and I'll switch to ITV or Sky. And no matter where you look, they're wanting to interview somebody and it's a screen. We're looking at a screen all the time. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm still struggling to accept that. I think I wonder if there is something as well about uh, a shift in how we look at news, that there is something a, a bit more intimate about being able to, um, you know, you're watching someone who's also sitting in their living room or their office telling you their experience, um, which becomes news almost as, at least for this year, this news almost as this hub for communications rather than a place where you see spectacle, you know? Um, and I wonder also if there's, um, you know, because we are hit over and over by, here's another giant story, here's another giant story, here's another breaking news. You know, is there a point uh, when people do, as Carl was saying, kind of go, you know, I will, I'll just read, I'll just read it tomorrow in, in the, you know, on Google News or something. I'll Would say you... being in the US, I, I think uh, for me, I'm <clears throat> breaking news fatigue. It's, 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 there's a point of, I want to go back to a documentary. I want to have somebody tell me a detailed story that's not the daily grind at some point. So I'm hoping what news we'll get back to is more of the, let me tell you, because I, I, I'm very fearful that breaking news is 
blocking the real stories that are not that we're not reporting on because we don't have time for it you know what else is happening in the background that uh we can look back and go wow we totally missed some bigger story because we're dealing with pandemics and elections and stuff so you know i hope that from my standpoint is you just see the shift to back to other types of stories of news and not so beating the the drumbeat of what's happening in the last five minutes because I, I for me after the election the next day i had to turn off the news and go i gotta watch the movie i just i just enough i gotta just turn away for a day nothing's gonna change in 24 hours <laughs> and i can't see it, watch it anymore so that was my own my own view so but i think this is a very 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 good point uh, i i think Okay, if you want your, your, your news to be watched, you need to be on all screen. That's, that's a given. You know, everybody understands this. You need to be everywhere, but you need also your content to be uh, personalized. And, you know, different platforms, different experiences, different consumers, different type of consumers. And you want those different, uh, those, those same news, those same stories to be, to be shaped differently depending on who is going to watch it. And I think this is a, one of the big characteristics of us as suppliers having to also adapt our editorial workflows. If you think of newsroom, it was it is still so focused on newsroom uh, on the rundown story. Sorry, we need to get away from from thinking rundown. We need to get get away from thinking you know TV first and then we are going to digital. We we need to leave to to give that freedom to the digital teams in order to take the leads on putting stories together on, on, on going digital first and this kind of things. I, 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 I'm, not a, I'm not a TV producer. I'm, I'm maybe not at the right place to say this, but I think that if televisions don't take that trend and don't adapt their production workflows to this, I mean, uh, that's, the future is looking bad for them. We, we do, actually, we do. I bet that, I mean, at the beginning when uh, digital platforms started, I mean, kicked off and they weren't as highly consumed as they are now, definitely the main driver was TV. But we all realized that TV is very important. It's the most expensive medium for news production. So definitely you're spending a lot and you're investing a lot to be able to produce. But at the same time, and we tried, we talked a lot, all of the newsrooms around the globe, because when I used to see my counterparts, colleagues from everywhere, they would say, we were talking about more integration. Now we're talking about being all over the place. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer the, of course, integration is very important. We used to kind of trying to push everything from TV to the digital platforms. Now they are semi-independent because they understand, I mean, producers of digital platforms understand that this goes on digital and it sells on and people. This is what they want to see or not. But at the same time, we re-modeled, uh, re, um, let's say, re-stitched our TV production in a way where we introduced certain techniques whereby the production of a new story would go well even if it plays on digital. So we had to work on both sides to be able to meet somewhere in the middle. Not every TV story should go on digital or vice versa, but at the same time, a big chunk, like for example, we used to have the story, the normal story would go two and a half minutes, two minutes to, that's very long for digital. Mm -hmm. So we, we said, okay, the longest story would go a minute, and between a minute and a minute and a half so that we can easily play it on, on digital. So there are certain things that we had to find a, a middle grounds actually in order to reduce the cost and because we have limited resources in, in terms of trained people. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, we all ventured in digital. I mean, years ago, we didn't really have the know-how and expertise of what that there were no, at the beginning, there were no Generation Zs and all those new jargons that are coming, new namings of uh, different gen uh, consumers over the digital platforms. So we're still in, I mean, definitely it's growing, definitely we're all going in this direction, but we cannot but see the bigger, I mean, I, I during the pandemic, especially the first two, three months, I think the biggest, the biggest story all over the world, because for once in, my whole life, the, I mean, the whole world united around one story. 
there were no contradictions. It was a big story wherever you, from China to Latin America to Middle East to whatever, wars come second, uh, deaths come second. Even the elections at the beginning, it started hyping, hyping up end, end of October, uh, November. Normally, the American elections just kind of occupies our screens throughout the year. But this year, people were so preoccupied by other, uh, this biggest news of uh, actually not the century even of our existence, um, I think all of our age groups more or less, that it is the biggest story and we, we are tired, but we still follow it. We get it on smaller portions now, but we still follow it because we, we need to know what's happening with the vaccine, the, um, the uh, casualties. I mean, we get scared now, especially that we're living on a second wave where things are going, uh, I mean, like before. So it's still the biggest story. There's also, sorry, I'll, Carl, I'll give you a chance here to talk as well, but I, I was wondering about that. You know, it is the big story and it's kind of a big giant story and it's a global story. Um, but what happens to those, and I, I wonder how technology might be able to help um, with those stories at the local level. So, you know, you have, um, you know, the, the, the vaccine, the pandemic, here are the national numbers, but um, what is the state of local news and like how, what about me hearing, you know, a, a reporter down at my local hospital, you know, and what's actually going on there. And I, I wonder if there's something about uh, being able to work to deliver more local news rather than, you know, it seems like a lot of news depending country to country and region to region, but there's a, there's a national outlook, outlook that's pushed down and maybe not enough resource and local areas for them to be telling their own stories. Do you, do you see that? And, uh, and is, there, is there an issue there that can be addressed or? We basically have a local station in, in every province. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, one of the challenges for us is as our audience um, uh, moves uh, to uh, other platforms uh, than television, um, our condition of license is still that we have to produce X amount of hours of uh, local television and network television per year. Uh, this comes with government uh, funding. Uh, so it's very hard to redirect uh, funds to uh, the digital effort. Uh, obviously we do it and we do it quite well given those uh, circumstances, but um, fundamentally something's gonna have to change uh, at the condition of license level. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to produce mediocre news <laughs> on television. You know, it's not like, you know, and obviously we've changed, you know, we've automated our production. Uh, we've, we've found, found efficiencies. One of the things that we found in terms of efficiencies is um, our uh, main news uh, network um, had a very large studio floor, a jib, you know, lighting cues, multiple large monitors. Uh, it was a big deal set and, you know, we'd host guests, et cetera. And um, when the pandemic hit, we moved to a much smaller location uh, so that we, so that we used less people here in the building fundamentally. So a uh, small location with robotics, um, 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 you know, no floor AD, no audio assist. And it became more intimate uh, for the viewer. Um, and to, uh, to uh, Mark's point, uh, you know, the whole not having a guest in the studio, everything is in boxes. And anyhow, all this to say that we've, we, we're, we're <laughs> it's pushing us to find more efficiencies, I guess. Um, and I'm not sure we're gonna go back to the large studio floor. I think that's, 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 old, that's an old thing now. And, um, 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 you know, Ruba, you touched on this. Uh, I wonder if the viewer would be unimpressed if we went back to the large facility, you know, the, the sort of the glamorous, you know, studio floor. Um, so anyhow, all this to say that, yeah, we try to find efficiencies in conventional broadcasting to apply to uh, other platforms, but it's, uh, it's a challenge. And do you guys shoot with mobile phone today? Uh, with uh, uh, iPhone stands or this kind of things? On the uh, you know, some. Um, I would say, if anything, we use smaller format cameras. 
Uh, our camera of choice for the videographers is the Sony XD Cam 500s. Uh, they're due to be replaced in a few years, but we've been deploying a lot of smaller cameras. Um, you know, the big, uh, the big issue with uh, shooting on uh, smartphones, well, there are two, I guess. Uh, light is one of them. And then um, the other one is uh, not having the ability to, uh, to zoom other than, you know, digitally and losing resolution and all those things. So there's still, there's still an appetite for conventional cameras, but um, in terms of uh, breaking news, for sure, we, we, we use them when necessary. We use uh, DeGero, a bonded cellular transmission quite a bit. And all of our reporters have the app on their uh, iPhones. So they can also go, go live with uh, DeGero. Um, and they're good to take pictures, right? But um, no, we still use conventional cameras. They're, used, they're mostly used when we have no access to proper cameras, actually. But when a journalist he has access or she has access to a proper camera, they always go. I mean, it's easier for the audio, lighting, as you mentioned, uh, resolution of the picture. But definitely they all have now, all journalists, I guess, at least all our journalists. When I mean, the ones in the field, they have the apps where they can stream. They can have, uh, I mean, they can cover lives and they do their own personal stand-ups from, um, from their own mobile phones when there is a lack of uh, proper camera. But I mean, now most of the people are like acting like regional journalists. And this is what actually the pandemic, because all of our journalists were not functioning within a proper crew, m most of them. So there was no crew. It was a one person who would do their camera, set up lighting, whatever they stand in front of the camera. All of the guests we're no, we no longer fly guests or get them into the studio. They're all Zooms. And that's why I say sometimes when the news, a big story breaks and it's such a powerful story, people forget about the resolution. We were all debating HD, 4K, 8K, and then all of a sudden we go back to uh, getting a live feed from Sudan or from Libya, which is a very bad resolution because they have a, a, a weak bandwidth, but the uh, guest is there through Zoom or through, uh, I mean, Skype, and people are happy because they're being, uh, I mean, they're getting news from uh, this part of the world where we'd like to, to see what is happening there. So uh, content overruled the quality. <coughs> Mark, I wanted... not... I'm sorry, go on, Ruba. <laughs> it will not go for long because that was very powerful news. So you cannot maintain it with low, with low uh, resolution and low quality. Mm -hmm. So we have now we started going back, but as um, Carl said before, definitely big format studios, normally they're nice, they're fascinating at the beginning, but people get bored with them. You, you show them once or twice, people are more interested. That's why we zoom more, we say the anchor is the main, uh, I mean, uh, the, the most important uh, part because he or she are delivering the news. People want to relate to them. So right. definitely, it it depends. But sometimes TV is a fascinating world. It's the world of good resolution, lighting, and a good show. Mark, I wondered about because you're also a visitor T, as you said. Um, you know, obviously acquired new tech. Um, and do do you have a sense of um, sort of local news and local stories? Um, that that the opportunities there changing, or especially using you know some of the types of tools that New Tech uh, kind of yeah yeah low bar to entry tools that yeah being able to sort of tell those stories. I know that there are a few initiatives out there, people trying sort of little niche kind of news mm -hmm. channels or little news channels that are serving specific audiences. Yeah, um, you know what 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 happens in the um, the main news in the in the areas of the UK, which is not just London, but we have the nations. Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, they've got their own, um, you know, production facilities doing their own use sometimes in different languages. In the, in, the, uh, uh, in the example of Wales, who've just moved to a brand new facility in, in Cardiff for IP oh. site. Um, but local news, unfortunately, um, has taken a little bit of a hit. Um, maybe it's not totally to do with the COVID pandemic. It's just the way things are, are, are changing. Um, a lot of it is to do with budgets. So certainly, you know, in the case of the BBC, they have a they have a lot of regional branches throughout the the uh, throughout England, um, running 
quite old hardware, uh, so old technology, which is ready for a, for a refresh. So yeah, they, they have to look at certainly uh, affordable options um, and taking advantage of new technology. Um, you know, NDI, for example, um, because I think I think the SDI workflows that we you know very well um, are just proving to be too um, cumbersome and expensive. So, so yes, we we've had to react, and we do have you know we are in the market to to help and supply in those areas where budgets are a little bit uh, tighter. But also the 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 one the need for local news is diminishing um, in the bigger picture. It's a shame for the local people who want to know what's happening around their corner. It still has to happen, but they are looking at ways to maybe consolidate. You know, do you have to have all these small branches dotted around the country when we are very much in a um, remote working um, uh, position? There is a there is a product called Vilo, uh, the BBC, which is virtualized radio, and they they discovered many years ago that we have the technology to not necessarily broadcast radio in these individual sites. We can make out we're in these sites, but you can streamline it into one hub. Um, so, you know, it was just a way to, uh, to get economical. Now we have the technology to, to kind of be able to do that. Um, and I guess the same thing goes with a latency. Um, when we're looking at the, um, the digital workflows, you know, making use of networks rather than, than SDI. So, yeah, it, it's, it, there's been a lot of um, a lot of brainstorming going on this year to see how they can go forward with with local news. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we've settled it yet. I, you know, I, I I don't think the plan is in place yet. Well, you know, as, as the conversation that we're having, it's not you know maybe a couple of years ago if we're thinking you know we need to wouldn't it be great to have a local news network for our just for our county you know. Um, but you know, whatever that that looks like, a news newsroom for the county or or for the city, you know, that is the, very local, you know, run by local people, local stories, whatever. Um, and before that would that might look like, well, you know, where are we going to get that money to build a newsroom, you know? Uh, and as we're discussing now, that's maybe not that's maybe not an issue anymore. There may be a whole different way you can think about that and, and do that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, and there so, are other things as well. When you come to think about it, before in order to get the news, you needed to have a TV station or a newspaper. Now on digital platforms, you can have it. It's easy, cheap. You put one camera, and then you feed it, you stream it, and that's it. They have. So I mean, it can be done at a much cheaper rate. I I, I do think that the, the the traditional viewing figures we've we've talked about already will will diminish again when we are we're allowed to go out. People will become much more dependent on their, 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 their mobile, um, like, like we, we have been for a few years now. Um, uh, Carl mentioned our, our viewers gonna want to see um, uh, big, large scale studio setups anymore. I think it all, it all depends on what stories you want to tell. Um, elections, I think we've set the bar. Ruba certainly set the bar in, um, in her news output. Uh, and obviously a lot of the um, the, uh, the, the big uh, uh, American Canadian networks, because the U.S. election was such a big event, it was it was an entertainment show. No matter how you look at it, it's news. It's very serious news. You want to know who your president is, but it's very much an entertainment show. And similar to sporting events, it's a bit of a competition. Um, you know, it, at VizRT, we we had a kind of a virtual election night party, whereby one of our headquarters in Norway. Bergen uh, kind of had all the news feeds coming in, all, 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 the, all the channels coming in. And we, we were comparing and people were taking votes. Who's got the best graphics? Who's got the best presenter? Who's, you know, okay. who's the <laughs> yeah, you, you guys are always, you know, the winners, you know, sure. But, but, but um, uh, it, what was interesting, and, and of course, a lot of our products are being used, especially in the graphics. So it's a big showcase for us, you know, it generates a lot of uh, PR. Um, but, you know, um, I, I think the show goes on no, no matter what and um, no matter how you consume it, whether it's digitally or on, on the big widescreen TVs. Um, so I, I would hate to see the demise of the, of, of the big show uh, oh. showcases, e even in news. It doesn't have to be sports. Sport will always have those shiny floors and so on. You know, it's something we, we particularly specialize in. But, you know, don't, don't, don't let the, um, the opportunity to, to show off all the greatest technology and who's got the best sets, you know, on election night. Let's not let that slip because it's just great for everybody. 
It's a, uh, it's a great well, viewer it's, experience, you know. I'm going to say we're uh, we are, as you can tell by the darkness surrounding me, uh, our, our time is winding down, uh, and so we've got you know another ten or fifteen minutes. And I want to sort of say to the uh, to to you from Bizzer T, Dalit, and TSL, Tom, Mark, and Rao, uh, you have two um, news uh, broadcasters here, um, and I wondered what question you would want to ask them and no sales pitches please what 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 is it that you know you want to ask them in terms of what they need what they want what you know what what is it i have mine ready <laughs> uh -huh. okay Raul, what what's your question to to which extent uh, you think that uh, your digital teams and your production teams are going to merge and to in in which kind of time frame I mean, as I mentioned before, actually, that uh, we try to fully merge. I don't think they will be 100% merged, not in the near future, maybe in a couple of years' time, because there are, it's like, it's exactly like if you're, if you're doing a business story, a news story, or a sports story. You need somebody who is more or less specialized in the target audience, in the content that you're producing. So there will always be special things. Do your, do your digital team use their own tools or they share the same tools, uh, the both. same editing tools? Both. Actually, they do both. They mm -hmm. use the same tools when it comes to taking, because they get material uh, native for themselves, I mean, for the platforms. They get materials that are shot for TV. So they just, I mean, we have the right system integrations whereby they can pull and edit. They use a lot of the systems that the, production broadcast team uses. At the same time, there are specific things when they do their native. Sometimes if they're shooting inside the, for example, our studios, they use the cameras that are there. Why should we? But definitely they are more adaptable to using automation and a one-man show than the broadcast uh, production is. So it's more or less they are interconnected and yet independent. So it's both at the same time. Yeah, so what I will say is uh, our newsrooms are integrated. Uh, you know, there's no there's no sort of segregation of digital teams or anything like that. So at least they're in the same room, uh, but very much uh, in line with Ruba's um, thoughts. Um, it's it's a, it's a different treatment online. And you know, at the beginning, you know, we tried to shove uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, material from to the TV platform, we'd, we'd shove it down uh, to, to online and it just didn't work. And, and um, so what I will say is, you know, morphing the newsroom from conventional TV to digital is, is what I think will, will ultimately happen. My questions are, um, do you see um, still having people work from home and remote? Um, you know, you see people going back in studio totally. Do you see a uh, decentralization to continue after COVID to where you still need people working from different areas? And the second question is then, um, and also, is there any technology you wish you had more of or was improved that you don't have now? So, so here's, okay. So it's been top of mind, obviously, right? Uh, we're, uh, our uh, building will continue to be in lockdown until the end of June. That's a, that's a sure thing. So I, so I have an envelope, I, I have time. And what I am seeing, hearing different organizations, conversations with people is that I would say that the vast majority of people want the balance of working from home and at work. Uh, so uh, for instance, the city of Toronto announced uh, yesterday that they were going to reduce their real estate footprint by 60% based on those same observations. So I could, uh, based on that, uh, I think that that will apply here. So my big focus from a technological standpoint is the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the user experience at home uh, to, and that has to mimic the user experience at work. And what we're looking at is our, you know, virtual mis machines, uh, virtual desktops. Um, so one of the technological requirements will be remote ingest. So we're looking into some of those uh, solutions. Um, so the idea is for, we wanna outfit everyone with a laptop, 
And when they come to work, we don't want them to come to work with their laptop. Their laptop can stay at home, but we're going to have uh, sort of pods, uh, hoteling pods that you book uh, through Google calendars or something. And those pods will uh, have uh, connectivity to the virtual machines. And um, so for instance, edit suites, um, maybe we reduce our edit suites by half. And uh, maybe those edit suites can be graphic suites also. Maybe they can be audio mixing facilities, uh, critical monitoring suites. So um, because I can see a requirement for people who are finishing an edit or something to want to come to work and work side by side with the producer in a, in a better environment. So um, at the end of the day, my number one priority right now is to, to have the, the same user experience at, at home than at work, the same desktop, the same tools, the same apps, same, same, uh, and not to work uh, locally uh, on your machine. I mean, now actually we have applied it for some time where uh, definitely Newsrooms, it's very healthy to have them on premises. The interaction, the, I mean, discussions, the, especially when it comes to the production teams, it's very important, but we cannot, we don't have this luxury. Anymore. So what we're doing now, and we, I think we'll continue doing this for some time until things settle down. And I'm sure that definitely support staff can work from home, but at the same time, the production teams, they rotate. Even now we're working, for example, just to ensure the, um, the non-spread of any cases. So we do teams, isolated teams for five days. This is what we're doing. So people work five days, they go home five days. So some of them, they work one or two days out of those five days. So they have to have the same setup at home as they have in, in on-premises. I'm talking about mainly reporters and producers. So we have them set up with Funny enough, because when we did our new studios, we had to change all of the PCs, update, upgrade, and everything. So I had, I was about to donate all of the old PCs, and then we re, we re just reformatted, set them up, uh, I mean, ship them to their homes, which was very convenient, very practical, because there was a shortage of laptops even in the market. So now what we're doing, we're going to continue doing this. We have people who are set up, who have special health conditions or whatever, who are set up, they work from home, they don't need to come. Definitely the space occupied by the staff will be, I mean, will be uh, reduced to, um, I wouldn't say half because still the, the bulk is studios and technical rooms. Uh, a lot of the staff, as, as we said now, they're occupied now as we speak. All of the PCs are there where the workstations are. We're going to have fit them somewhere in technical areas. And then people will have access to them, whether we have hot seating for them or they're operating from home. They can connect to the same machine. So especially for the graphics people, uh, edit, I mean, craft editors, all of those people, definitely they will be, uh, I mean, uh, they'll be able to operate both from their homes and from the office. So what was the the, uh, um, the the bit of technology or tools that you wish you had available? One of our most challenges, especially in the part of the uh, in the part of the world where we operate, uh, and is bandwidth issues. So I um, mean, having a high resolution of videos for people to be able to put material from the headquarters and sending materials is a big challenge, especially when you're talking about. Middle East, North Africa, where bandwidth is very expensive and then it's very scarce at the same time. So it's not very easy to get a one gig or five gig like we do in Europe or in the States or even in, in the Gulf, we are relatively okay. There are a lot of restrictions and a lot of uh, lack of redundancies and stuff like this. So we need to find solutions whereby even with small uh, bandwidth, the smallest bandwidth ever, you can get a very high resolution of uh, pictures. This is one of our main challenges. Hmm. Trying to unmute Carl to get his response on that, because you didn't get to respond to that question, did you, Carl? Uh, yeah, a, a bit of ingest uh, solution, and also one of uh, our priorities is faster VPN, hmm. uh, because, uh, because it's about 20% uh, slower now, so that's a big issue. Uh, connectivity was a bit of an issue at the beginning uh, of COVID, uh, but not for the same reasons, just because people uh, are uh, quite savvy sometimes and uh, their connectivity at home wasn't uh, 
quite uh, uh, fast enough, but people took it upon themselves to, uh, to fix that. Mark, can you, um, uh, what do you want to ask? We're, we're focusing more on the cloud. I know it's been a term around for many years, but now it's more serious than ever. We want to develop more um, production in the cloud. Now, how important is it to the, to the broadcasters uh, for us to perfect this? You know, whether it be the latency or reliability, you know, would you advise a company like VizRT to keep that concentration up for the obvious reason? Oh, yes. I always have an issue actually with VizRT because VizRT are, uh, I mean, is a, soft, is a system that is based on a lot of hardware. A lot of hardware. Yeah. So It's a common thing what you said, you know, the BBC would say, you know, uh, you've got the software and you've got an instance of software on each bit of hardware. You know, how can we look at a way of some kind of consolidation? Obviously, a lot of people are moving to the more virtualized environment for the back end. But the actual rendering processing, what really gets you graphics on screen, you know, it's still being recommended to, to have that hard box. Um, well, that, I think, is that. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. And this is our, our first feed video roundtable. Um, this will be available in the digital version of Feed Magazine and online. Um, and uh, thank you very much.